Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one on the books of First and Second Peter. It's entitled, Feed My Sheep, First and Second Peter. And this particular lesson is lesson number four in that series for April 22 of 2017, entitled, Social Relationships. Now that ought to get people thinking. There's a lot of social relationships we could talk about. So while you're putting on your thinking cap and grabbing your Bible, let's offer a prayer to guide us in our discussion. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the social relationships that we are able to enjoy as human beings. We know that not every social relationship here on this earth is filled with love and joy and peace and comfort and encouragement. Uh, there's a lot that aren't. Help us to know how we can make the relationships that we engage in more meaningful and more fruitful is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to begin something in this lesson that's going to continue for several lessons. In 1 Peter 2, especially verses 13 to 23, and then 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, and later on in chapter 3, and then on to chapter 4, Peter talks about the sufferings that the Christians are going through that he's writing to there in what we would call northern Turkey today. And, of course, that leads us to ask about social relationships, relationships to the government, relationship to, let's say, our bosses or our fellow workers in, in our work environment, relationships with our spouses, relationship to other church members because we are part of that church organization. And boy, we could, we, we, if we wanted to exhaust all those subjects, we could be here for several days, couldn't we? So how are we supposed to relate, first of all, to, to the government? which we know in the near future, let's be honest, as Adventists, we, we have this special understanding of Revelation 13. How are we supposed to relate to a government which we know in the near future will act like a dragon? Revelation 13, verses 11 to 18. More than that, how will America force people to pay homage to the first beast, who in turn gets its authority from the dragon which we know from Revelation 12 is the devil himself. So if the devil himself gives his authority to the first beast and the first beast is given his authority to the United States government, how's that going to work out for people who want to be Christians? Real well, right? God's going to have to do some protecting. Back to the days of Nero. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think the the emperors in, in, in Peter's and Paul's day got their authority from the devil? Well, Peter and Paul said that all authority is given by God. There would be no... It, Jesus said to, to Pilate, well, you so know, if the, you, you would have no authority over me unless it was given from above. So when the U.S. US government in the future sometime is enforcing laws which we know are a direct contradiction to God's law, and they get that authority from the first beast that's described there in Revelation 13, and he in turn gets his authority from the devil. That's a case of God's giving people up to laws that were not good. E yes. Ezekiel 20, 25, and 26. Mm -hmm. I gave them over, which is an example of God's wrath. He gives you over if you want to move away from his sphere of protection. One of the groups, so we're going we're gonna to hit on some of these groups that he was talking about. One of the groups that he talked about were slaves. Now, we, we don't think there are any slaves around us here, those of us living here in the United States of America. And, uh, but we need to recognize, we need to be fair with the text that it has been estimated that up to 60% of the population of the Mediterranean world in their days were slaves. <coughs> now, these slaves came from several way they, they became slaves several ways some of them were people who had been uh, 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 the citizens of nations that had been conquered by the romans so they were forced into slavery be, by being conquered a lot more probably were slaves because they got themselves into debt and they couldn't pay their debts 
So they would sell themselves into slavery for a period of time in order to pay their debts. And we'll talk about the implications of that a little later. And there were probably some other reasons that are not, w not so well known why there were slaves in Peter's and Paul's day. So what do you think? Does Peter's counsel about dealing with masters and slaves have anything to do with employers and employees in our day? Well, they didn't have the, they didn't have the um, money system that we do now. Okay. Uh, How does that impact to, us? Well, people used to work for families, you actually become part of their family in their economic system, bartering and whatever mm -hmm. type of thing. And so it's just, you can't really, can't really compare our freedom to even back then to the free person. Mm -hmm because they were all under some authority somewhere. Okay. And, and so it's a we're little bit We're not under any authority? Well, not like they were. Okay. Not like they were, because we have a constitution, and, and there's, a, there's a kind of a philosophy behind that I that's can, different than, yeah. than was back then. I can tell you that there's a constant, ongoing battle or, or plan by labor unions to force employees in Seventh-day Adventist hospitals and schools to join the labor union. How should we relate to those kinds of things? Should we say, well, yeah, we're in favor of fairness to employees, let us join the unions? Well, right now the unions are kind of a, a new way of taxing, a private taxer. That's yeah. all they are. Uh -huh. Plus they, so it's they don't just negotiate with you, for you, they also have a political agenda and send yeah. you stuff well, it's uh, uh, about what going. you should do. You know, you should yeah, write you should and vote. support this bill and that. <coughs> <coughs> and we know that m many labor unions in the past have been very, very corrupt. Does that mean that they're still all corrupt? Well, there's a, a, a mixture. Uh, Back when we were living in Washington in the 80s, the National Football League Players Union went on strike, and two of the Seahawk uh, players respectfully refused to join in that because they were Christians. And the text that they used was uh, John, uh, people came to John asking what should we do in response to repent about repentance, and he said to the soldiers, uh, do not take my money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Mm. So <laughs> that was, it's probably not the favorite verses of labor unions. No, but when, when the labor union came to Kaiser and, and got the, the uh, physical therapists involved, that's what part of my write up to get out of the union mm -hmm. was. So. Yeah. Well, Peter also talks about relationship between husbands and wives, and maybe we're going to have to talk about that a little bit. Unfortunately, divorce has become incredibly common in the United States. More than 50% of marriages end up in divorce. But as disturbing as that is, divorce rates among Adventists are almost the same as those of the world. Why is that? Aren't we supposed to be Christians? What does being Christian have to do with divorce? I mean, that's God hates divorce. Is Malachi says that. Malachi 3, is it verse, oh, it's 2, verse 6, I think. Well, we're all, we're in a Christian nation, mm -hmm. so that would follow Shouldn't if everybody was the same. Mm -hmm. If they, the problems are all the same with all, with everybody in the United States, so. <laughs> we, we live in a world where upheaval has become the norm. And so how are we supposed to relate to hot button issues? I mean, just, just to mention a few that are going on right now. Abortion, immigration, illegal immigrants. Should we be, should we be out on the streets? Should the, should the Adventist church organize ourselves every week? What's the, what's the thing we need to, 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 to demonstrate about this week? And we'll all go out and stand on the street corners and demonstrate. I think the true Christian has got better things to do. Okay. And that is to spread the, go the singular gospel. 
And that gospel is all about loving one another. Would we have these problems with unions, with bosses, with husbands, wives, if we all had that love? They would all vanish. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that, um, I think you can take up sides mm -hmm. one way or the other. I think what the devil wants is the fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, the devil's not really on any side. He just manipulates things for the well, he's, fight. He's on and the side against God. Well, that's true. That's true. But still, when it, when it comes to, you know, men trying to deal with each other, you know, what he tries to do is get them upset so that they'll fight. Because when they fight, the spirit has the hardest time making well, his influence. And he influence. can't use truth. He has to use deception, yeah. lies, and, and innuendo in order to get his point across. He divides to conquer. Yeah. Yeah, he divides. Christians will be forced in the near future, we know this, between conforming with societal norms and obeying government decrees versus obeying the Word of God. And it's going to come down to that. Do we, say, do we see ways even today in which the government is gradually encroaching on freedom of religion? Very active. Mm. But at the present time, there's also a lot of action to try and stop that. It's a mm. question of how far it'll go. I get so many letters in the mail about that. I think we as Adventists need to be aware of how trade unions function. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's corruption. There's corruption in these, the street stuff we're seeing going. Is it all? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But uh, not all unions are the same. There's another trap. No. Uh, if you want to get into some of the professions, some of the trades, you don't often don't have a choice. No. Uh, some unions will let you okay, you don't want to be in the union, you're going to pay the same fees, but you'll pay from a list of charities. That you yeah. pick your charity. I've been involved in that before. Yeah. Well, here's one, th here's what, one of the things that really worries me. We, we can read in the book of Revelation what's coming, but w we are smart enough, I'm sure, to realize that the devil is not going to wait till all of a sudden one day Chomp, all of a sudden he's going to pass a whole bunch of laws and change everything. That's not the way he works. He's way too clever and way too subtle for that. And so what we're going to find is that our government and other things are on some kind of a slippery slope. And at what point in that slippery slope do you say, okay, that's it. Now I have to start opposing. And those, those... You don't think he's opposing right now? The government, I mean, the devil or the, the government? Devil. Oh, yeah, but I'm saying, I mean, do you, do you think, I mean, surely the gov our government is not now as rapidly on the devil's side as it will be just before Jesus comes. But we see some of the rights, some of the guaranteed constitutional rights just slowly eroding. So at what point do we say, well, I'm sorry, but I can't go any further? I mean, I, I don't know how to put that in any better words. Um, think about Nero in, in Paul's day. You could be tortured and put to death for the slightest intimation that, that there's problems. Um, we're gonna, we're, in a future lesson, we're going to look at the, a quotation from Pliny the Younger, who was one of the governors for the northern territories of Judea, of, uh, of Asia Minor, which is Turkey today, talking about this very thing, and he talks about the steps he went through in determining whether or not Christians are to be put to death. It's pretty scary. Well, back in those days, the government was full of corruption. It was full of nepotism. Um, some people say some of those generals, some of those overseers were as corrupt as Nero himself. It's a little hard to imagine, but <laughs> maybe so. You think there's any risk of nepotism in the United States government today? It's been going on for years. <laughs> well, Peter says something interesting in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 14. And to the governors who have been appointed by him, that's suggesting that God is the one who authority, has authority for all government, to punish evildoers and to praise those who do good. 
do governments always punish evildoers and always praise those who do good? I wish. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice, huh? I mean, to take an extreme example, look at the Middle East today. Pick, pick the case of a, a Christian who lives in Syria. Well, the Roman Empire's activities did facilitate the spread of the gospel. So let's give them credit for that much. They built roads. Of course, the purpose of those roads was that their military could move around fairly efficiently, but they did build roads. They enforced a common language, which in, in the early years was that Koine Greek. Uh, we know on some occasions that Paul's life was saved by his punishments were, because he saved from punishment because he said, you can't do that to me. I'm a Roman citizen. Silas was too. And they enforced the peace, the mm -hmm. Pax yeah. Romana. Yeah. Because he had, so there was still danger of travel, but it was safer on yeah. the whole because of all these uh, soldiers who could be around at any moment. Yeah, and if you're, if you're traveling on a major sort of thoroughfare where a lot of people travel, it's not as dangerous if you're out there all by yourself trying to find your way. Um, well, so what about us in our day to, to talk about our relationship to the government? Uh, should we be the best citizens we possibly can be? Yes. We should, shouldn't we, as far as possible? Yes. Well, think about the conditions under which Jesus lived. Remember that we're looking for a more perfect world to come? What, is, what does Paul say about our citizenship? Do you remember Philippians 3.20? We, however, are citizens of heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. So, uh, and I, I read some interesting commentaries on that verse. We don't have time to discuss them all now, but the idea is we, we need to be good as citizens here, but always we are looking beyond the present to that future kingdom. So we're not, we're not, we don't want to oppose our current government. We want to support them as much as possible. We want to pay our taxes and so forth. But we're always looking. My real citizenship is where? In heaven, right? Yeah, and Jesus is an example of that because he even paid his tax to the den of thieves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Peter says, 1 Peter 2, in fact, maybe I can take just a moment to read those four or five verses there. You servants must submit to your masters and show them complete respect, not only to those who are kind and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. God will bless you for this if you endure the pain of undeserved suffering because you're conscious of his will. For what credit is there if you endure the beatings you deserve for having done wrong? But if you endure suffering, even when you've done right, God will bless you for it. It was to this that God called you, for Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no one ever heard a lie come from his lips. When he was insulted, he did not answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but placed his hopes in God, the righteous judge. Can we follow that example today? Well, if we did, the... Um the devil's object to make everybody fight wouldn't work anymore. Well, not at least among Christians. It might work among his own sinful well, people. Yeah, I think he, he looks at the Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, in 1 Peter 2.18, what part of what we just read, the word used there for slaves is oiketes, which refers to domestic slaves. The people the slaves that actually worked, work in houses for their masters, works along with them, prepare the meals, you know, clean the house, whatever like that. There's also a more general term for slaves in Greek, doulos, which is much more commonly used in the New Testament, which refers to any kind of a, a, of a slave. And Paul uses that repeatedly. Uh, for an example, Ephesians 6, verse 5, where it says, slaves obey your human masters with fear and trembling and do it with a sincere heart as though you were serving Christ. What about us today? Do we do our jobs as if we were serving Christ? The question is for you too out there. Yeah. 
whatever you, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do mm -hmm. all to the glory of God. Well, I can just give you an example of how, a little, one simple example of how the slaves are treated in Paul's day. There's an, a case, documented case, where on one occasion a slave got really angry and killed his Roman master. And to make sure that that didn't spread, 400 slaves were killed in response. 400 slaves were killed in response to that one killing by the slave of his master. Well, on the other hand, we need to remember that there were some slaves who had immense responsibilities. There was the Pythagogas, whose responsibility was to keep the children safe. There were Pythagogoi, who were teachers. There were, there were others who were, master, were leaders of their masters, or, or in charge of the master's entire estates. Uh, think of, going way back in history, think of the story of Joseph. What did he do with Potiphar? And uh, there were other positions. Um, but remember that many of those who got into slavery in Jesus' day got that way because they couldn't pay their debts. So if they somehow got some money or a relative did it for them or someone else, a friend did it for them, they could be redeemed. And what does redeemed mean? Someone could pay the price. Mm -hmm to make them free again, but not to take them over as slaves. Yeah. Ephesians 1 verse 7 talks about that. Romans 3 24 and Colossians 1 14. Uh, maybe I'll read the Colossians verse. By whom we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. So the idea is that Jesus paid the debt for us. Now a lot of people like to talk about that and, and, and I understand why. But there's more than just having our debts, our, our sins paid for. There's a lot more to the Christian life. We need to move on. Slaves are reminded that they did not get credit for being beaten for doing wrong. We already read that. They only received credit, in quotation marks, if they were beaten for doing right. So if we faithfully submit to those in responsible positions today, is there ever a time for us to stand up for our rights? We talked a little bit ago about, do we need to be out there in the streets, you know, demonstrating? Are, are Christians just supposed to be uh, doormats for people to walk on? Well, there's a balance. He who seeks to save his life shall lose it. So when we stand up for our rights, we may be driven by you know, carnal desire, you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, boastful pride of life kind of uh, spirits. So uh, there are uh, uh, times to stand up, though, for things. Uh, Daniel and his friends okay. stood up for their dietary habits, and, but they did it in a, not in a defiant way, but uh, in a reasonable way. He yeah. uh, gave a, the uh, person over them a chance to save face. <laughs> yeah. So if we were to, I, I know this isn't the only classification, but if we're trying to say, I'm going to stand up for my selfish rights, that probably is not appropriate. But if we're standing up for human dignity, if we're standing up for God, like the examples of Joseph and Daniel and his friends so forth, that's always going to be the right thing to do. Okay, we come to another major section, 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7. And the same way you wives must submit to your husbands, so that if any Amen. of them... What? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying to get me to speak up. <laughs> <laughs> so that if any of them do not believe God's word, you con your conduct will win them over to believe. So, Gordon, you need to have conduct that will make your wife really want to love you. It will not be necessary for you to say a word, because they will see how pure and reverent your conduct is. You should not use outward aids to make yourselves beautiful, such as the way you do your hair or the jewelry you put on or the dresses you wear. Instead, your beauty should consist of your true inner self, the ageless beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of the greatest value in God's sight. For the devout woman, women of the past who placed their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful by submitting to their husbands. Sarah was like that. She obeyed Abraham and called him her master. 
You are now her daughters if you do good and are not afraid of anything. Hmm. In the same way, you husbands must live with your wives with the proper understanding that they are weaker than you. Treat them with respect because they also will receive, together with you, God's gift of life. Do this so that nothing will interfere with your prayers. Okay, you husbands, do you want anything to interfere with your prayers? Well, what does that mean? <laughs> I asked you first. <laughs> Makes it sound like the wives are nagging, so that it interrupts the prayers. <laughs> so they're they're praying all the time, and your wife comes up and bothers you. Is I, I think it's you know, more. What are you possessed with? What are what's uh, what do you what are you consumed with? Is it with your prayer life, or is it with you know making it trying to make your wife or husband submit? Mm -hmm. Well, if yeah. we're not. Uh, exhibiting God's spirit in our relationships, then that hinders our prayers. Because uh, that's Peter, the essence of sin. Peter, Peter and Paul also are also talking about people who are married to unbelievers. Now, I'm going to assume, and I, I'm sure this isn't a blanket, doesn't all, isn't always correct, but probably in many cases in their day, it was a case where one of the, well, after they're already married, one spouse becomes a Christian. And what are they supposed to do in, the, in that circumstance? Are, are you supposed to say, well, because I'm a Christian and you're not a Christian, I'm going to divorce you? What do Peter and Paul tell us about that kind of stuff? Stay married if you can. Stay with them if you can. Why is that? You might convert them. Yes. It turns out, I mean, a lot of research has been done on this. It turns out that new Adventists, new Christians, are the most effective people at reaching out to others around them, bringing them into the church. People who have been in the church for a long time are not nearly as successful at reaching out to other people as people who come in new. Why do you think that is? So let's hope in this case it would be husbands winning their wives or wives winning their husbands. So why, why, are, why are new converts more effective as evangelists? Well, they haven't gotten not. lazy. What? They haven't gotten lazy. They haven't gotten lazy, okay. They're naive. The ones who have been there for long or the, one, the, ones, the new ones that are coming in? The new in? ones. Mean, why, what do you mean yeah. by naive? That can be a good thing, though. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Naive can be a good you thing know. because you'll actually go in and try something. Yeah. yeah. Well, part of the reason is that, and this has been studied even in our church, what you find is that people who, have, who, who when they first become Adventists, they still have a g significant group of close friends that are non-Adventists. And they want to share something that's exciting to them with those people that are still non-Adventists. By the time uh, an ad, the average Adventist has been an Adventist for seven years, they no longer have any non-Adventist friends. Almost all their close friends are now Adventists. That's, that's been documented. They converted their close friends? or Well, I hope in some they cases me. they've converted their close friends, or now they've just found it's more comfortable to be with other people who think like they do, and so they, they sort of drop off the the friends who are non-Adventists, and they, they stick with the Adventists. It's to be almost incestuous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Boy, oh, I listen to that language. <laughs> well, the well, ones... I mean, you've got to look yeah. back if you've yeah. been in the mm -hmm. church any length of time. The friends that they had, if they haven't responded in seven years, are probably still doing a lot of the behaviors, going to the bars or, you know, whatever that they've, the Christian has left behind, so, yeah. so they, they no longer... That certainly must be part of the problem, yeah. Well, surely every Christian should live a kind of life that would be winning to someone who's willing to be, willing to respond. Wouldn't it be fair to say at least that much? Well, the role and status of women through much of history has been bleak. Even in the days, and so I'm so glad you're here, Myra. <laughs> Even in the days of the Protestant Reformation, the role of women was very low. Look at this note found in the, ninth, in the 1549 reprinting 
of the Matthew, Matthew's Bible, which was originally printed in 1537. So this is a, a reprinting. And this gentleman by the name of Edmund Beck decided that he needed to add some extra notes when he reprinted the Bible. After reading Peter's counsel that wives be in subjection to your own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham in 1 Peter 3, 1 and 6, Mr. Beck attached a note in the margin to male readers. And I'm going to read it here. And if you want to look at it on the screen there, his, lang his, his spellings were the old spellings and so forth. But it goes something like this. He dwelleth with his wife according to knowledge that taketh her as a necessary helper and not a bond servant or a bond slave. That sounds good. And if she be not obedient and helpful unto him, endeavoreth to beat the fear of God into her head, that thereby she may be compelled to learn her duty and do it. Okay, is that the way we're... <laughs> I've got that on here. What? I have that on my phone. Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean you have it on your phone? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's Talk well. I, I have it in that. my library at home too. But uh, the, the the original it's my 1549 instead of a 1537. Well, it's the 1549 is the one that uh, has it, uh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but there's more than one edition there. I, I I need to tell you that Peter, I'm uh, Peter, the Jim hasn't uh, uh, just collected that particular Bible. Yeah, how many Bibles do you have in your collection now? Mm, about 1500. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> And one of them is one of those. He has some very, very... Well, the, the text is it refers to as the Wife Beater Bible, yeah, I think. Yeah, it's called the Wife Beater Bible. And they have one of the, the, the Bug Bible and so yeah, forth. Yeah, oh yeah, and the Wicked Bible. Wicked Bible. There's one, wick, the Wicked Bible is the one where they left the word not out when it says, you shall commit adultery. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not sure, I'm not sure whether that was intentional or... Uh, well, there's only 11 of those still... Really? Uh, in existence, yeah. One's down in Texas. I, the the owner the, the, loaned it to me about, uh, what was it, about 15 years ago. Yeah. I, I copied it off. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter spoke about husbands. Now, let's, let's balance the picture here a little bit. Peter spoke about husbands living with their wives, understanding that they are the weaker sex. Now, this is not talking about physical strength and that kind of stuff. The expression weaker vessel in the original language, in verse 7 of some translations, does not refer to physical or emotional weakness. It refers to finely made dishware. Very likely it is a reference to how men should treat women behaving toward them as if they were a valuable piece of china, which should be handed, handled with great care and regarded lest it be broken needlessly. The expression is a positive assessment of the value of the wife and the considerate and gentle manner in which she should be treated. How do we assess the value of women in our lives? So so. That's from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Guide. Yes. I, I was questioning the phrase, regard lest it be broken needlessly. Yeah. Needless. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, it still implies Well, you've got to beat the fear of the Lord into her head, right? Well, mm. that's almost what it implies. Yeah. Mm, no. Well, well, to me, to China, me, go ahead. Well, to me, I have to say, yesterday I accidentally knocked. I didn't break it, but I knocked uh, my mug off of the table. Hmm. It didn't break, but it was foolish of me because I had it right next to the edge. When I got up, I didn't even know I'd hit it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the way I'm saying is be careful what you do mm -hmm. with this precious piece. Don't that's you know? Right. Maybe that means don't beat them, but I don't didn't get that out of that. Well, Bible believing Christians, I, I, would, I would hope, I consider myself to be one of those, believe that God's original plan was for Adam and Eve to be equal partners. Now, the entrance of sin apparently has necessitated, necessitated the fact that one member, in this case the husband, was designated to be the head of the household. But I think the closer we get back to God's ideal, the closer we ought to be able to get to an equal partnership. And maybe I'll have to drop it there. Um, many times, Paul and... Does that mean that women can be ordained ministers? Oh, let's of course. I, you need to open that door. If, 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 <laughs> if, if women can be presidents of the United States, they can certainly be an ordained minister. 
Well, there are a lot of passages from Paul, Romans 13, 1 to 7, Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 16, and Galatians 3, 27 and 28. Maybe I should read, look at that one in Galatians 3 real quick like. You were baptized into union with Christ, and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You're all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. And I'm sure that Paul especially, but maybe even some of the other disciples grew up with that prayer. There was a famous Jewish prayer, Jewish male prayer back in those days. And he got up in the morning and the first thing he says, I'm thank, I thank the Lord that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And it was in that order. Um, we definitely need to get away from that. So what is our responsibility living in our society in our day? Do we really think that society is going to make major changes in the direction of what is right? Do we see things getting better and better in our world? Not at the present time. <laughs> Not at the present time. Well, I, I wonder about <clears throat> that question. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it that... Um, the Lord's word doesn't isn't powerful enough to change the world, and that that we let it go worse and worse and worse. So God has to come and take His power and straighten it out. That's what it sounds like. Well, I I would look at that comment in a different way. I would say, what percentage of the population of our world today is paying any attention at all to God's word? So. Pretty what, low. What? And unfortunately, I will tell you that I, I, from time to time, have the opportunity to, to teach a group of young people, Adventist young people. And the amount of biblical illiteracy is appalling. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, well, there was a time when you couldn't get a Bible. So. <laughs> well, not in the United States, not since you've been alive. Well, I, I don't know. If... if if God's ways don't work out in society and it can't move the world one way or the other and he has to still come and blow it up mm -hmm. and straighten it out through his power. Yeah. So that's the well, only question I've got about this worse and worse business that, yeah, well, that well, let's, um, sin he, is going he to can't seed. do it. He's going to, going to sin, seed. Sin is going to seed. It's showing all its... All, all the all evil ability. effects, the, the true effect of sin. True effect of sin. Yeah. So, so it's, that it's would... It's a destroyer. It destroys the people to the point that they cannot so respond God's, to God's grace. So God's ways can't overcome the seeds. At some point. At, at, some, at point, some point, they, they can no longer be saved. I, I think White. you need to think about that a little more. Oh, I don't yeah. know if it, <laughs> if it, if it well, comes the, out that way because it always ends freedom. up... It ends up with God at the end taking his power and straightening everything out again and saying, see, look it. You need no. my power to straighten it out. No, it won't no he doesn't. If, no. He could, if he could straighten things out with his power, he would save everybody. And clearly that is not what's going to happen. Well, I know, but still... If things get worse and worse oh. and worse, so and what God happened? doesn't, what happens doesn't is stop it with his power, well, then it will go on. all oh, over oh, the oh, universe, oh, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, hold on. What happens is, and this is clearly spelled out, it's implied in Bible, by, but the wording is a little different. Ellen White says, God's withdrawing his Holy Spirit from this earth. And what that means is that people are allowed more and more freedom. So people will choose what they want to do. More Those who freedom, you shouldn't say it that way because well, that's what God wants everybody to have. Well, and and yes, so He how does. Can you have <laughs> no, that's that's exactly more and what more freedom. Well, what that means is that people who want to do right will do what's right, and people who want to do wrong will do what's wrong, and God will simply one day come and draw a line and says, "You people have chosen your side, and you people have chosen your side. I don't need to do any more. I, all I have to do is draw a line." Still, at the end, He's going to have to stop it with His power. Yes, but start it over again. 
You've got to recognize what the power is. And if you look at First, uh, first Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross, skip a little bit, is the power of God, mm -hmm. which means that the power of God is a message. Either you accept it and you have that power, and it turns out to be love, or you don't accept it. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens? There is this separation that will take place among humans. Some will be at his right, like the goats and the sheep. So people start making their decision the other way, and that there's got to be a point where God will stop it with his might no, and power. No, no. He, no, doesn't, he, doesn't, no. he doesn't stop it. That's it the point. Go to seed. He lets the people who want to go that direction, he says, let them go. Yes. I mean, that's, that's clearly... Uh, let me read you the verse. I'll, I'll read it right out of the Bible. Let me just grab my... So when the Lord comes and it says the elements melt... Oh, that's, oh, that's later on. That's, that's after everything's yeah. dead. But still, that's my point. At the end, the power comes and straightens everything out again. Here's, here's, here's the word. The people <laughs> of Israel are under Where, the... Where are you reading from? I'm reading from Hosea 4, verse 17. The people of Israel, and that's who he was talking about at that point in time, are under the spell of idols... Let them go their own way. Well, that's fine. There's no problem with that with me, but still, at the end... The if, if, the, once once everything everybody is, is chosen, once everybody is chosen, which side they want to be on, it's not God coming and using some force. It's God just saying, okay, you've chosen which side you want to be on. Okay, and then what happens? Well, what happens to that point... God lets those who have chosen death die, and He lets those who have chosen life live forever. Lets them die? Yeah. Yeah, the power they, you are talking they about. They call it, for the rocks, and, you know, they call yeah. for death, and God in His mercy. Well, my point is that I'm just, I'm just wondering about a track where everything gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and think that, well, how's it going to stop mm -hmm. unless... Well, unless what, what, what something comes in and stops it. Yeah. Well, let's let's look at what the Bible and again Ellen White actually portray. What's going to happen at the end is that God is going to remove Himself so much that He's going to allow the devil to bring the seven last plagues, and millions and millions, maybe billions of people are going to be destroyed by the devil, and God will say. Do we really need to let this go on? Those are my children. I don't want, I don't want any of them to die. But Satan is going to do all that. And, and the universe looking on will say, we've seen enough. And God says, okay, then I can come and bring it to a conclusion. Which is the power I'm talking about. It's well, but up a if blind you... Alley. We're, we each are responsible for our own welfare if we choose to. That's true. That's are, true. Are you, are you, but I'm just power. saying that... that God's way will end up going towards them again. What do you mean by going towards them? Coerce them into what? submission? No. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just saying that God's wisdom, if everybody follows God's wisdom. Uh, if, wouldn't that be wonderful? We're told the last well. movements will be rapid ones. This, once it starts, it's going to go pretty fast. If, if you were God and you loved all of everybody who lives on planet Earth because every one of them is your child, and now you see the devil just destroying them, a million, two million, is, how many billions maybe, as fast as he can, is it loving to just say, well, I, I don't want to get involved here. Let me, you know, let, leave the world to him. No, it's not loving to do it. It's better. It's, then to stop that. Well, Again, so are you it, saying that it's not God's right to, to do that? No, I'm saying that's fine. That's, that's all right. But I'm just wondering if, it, if he let it just keep going, that means his wisdom would no, not overcome it. Th this lesson talks about that a little bit. Let, let me okay. read. Let's read some inspired words on that subject, the, the future time of trouble. And if, if we would say to those who are out there in the audience, if you have the book, The Great Controversy, by Ellen White, pages 613 to 634, 613 to 634, the whole chapter is about the time of trouble. And I picked out just two or three spots. The deepest poverty, the greatest self-denial with his approval is better than riches, honors, ease, and friendship without it. 
We must take time to pray. If we allow our minds to be absorbed by worldly interests, the Lord may give us time to, by removing from us our idols of gold, of houses, or fertile lands. That's 622, paragraph 2. The time, reading on, the time of trouble, such as never was, is soon to open upon us, and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess, and which many are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself before God. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. 622, paragraph 4, desire, uh, great controversy. As the crowning act, reading on, as the crowning act and the great drum of, de of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look for the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. And there, you can read about that in Revelation 1, 13 to 15. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come, Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. As Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth, his voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious, heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. Page 624, paragraph 2. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be test tested. 593, paragraph 1. And I don't, I mean, how much do we need to go on here? But those who endeavor to obey all the commandments of God will be opposed and derided. They can stand only in God. In order to endure the trial before them, they must understand the will of God as revealed in His Word. They can honor Him only as they have a right conception of His character, government, and purposes. Do we have a right understanding and perception of God's character, His government, and His purposes? And we need, we need to act in accordance with them. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will strand to the last great conflict. What does that mean? What does it mean to fortify your mind with the truths of the Bible? Now, some people think that, okay, what I need to do is memorize five texts about each doctrine so I can be prepared. Is that what we need to do? No. Maybe that's a start. Well, that might be a start. But well, ultimately, it's Jesus that the scriptures point to, as he pointed out. You know, you search the scriptures because you think you have life in them, but they testify of me. So. Mm -hmm. The ultimate truth is uh, of the Bible is Jesus, which is uh, the love of God mm -hmm. uh, for the world. John 17, 3, you've seen, you know, eternal life is to know the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. relatively simple. Well, to every soul, a reading on, this is page 593, paragraph 2 in the Great Controversy, to every soul will come the searching test, shall I obey God rather than men? The decisive hours, even now at hand, are our feet planted on the rock of God's immutable word. We, we need to read that word. We need to study it. We need to read it in different, I think, different, different uh, translations, even paraphrases in some cases, so that the ideas hit us. Because 
uh, I mean, I don't know the rest, other, rest of you, your experience, but I find when you read a passage in a new translation, something else sticks out that it didn't stick out the same in, in the one you're more familiar with. Sounds like you're not going to make it unless you're a scholar. No. Yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. saying you're not going to make it unless you, you come to love what you read in the scriptures and you're familiar with Focus. what God has, has, has presented. And that's not talking about whether some, if somebody has to reach that to be saved. It's saying that hmm. they will stand through the last great conflict. That will be a very special time, and it will take special people. But it doesn't mean that you have to reach some thing in order to be saved, because you have entered into salvation once you've uh, received the Holy Spirit and, and accepted Christ. The, the Adventist Church has had some very challenging experiences in the past. We have had nations in the world in pla different places where the nation has determined to become Muslim or the nation has determined to become communistic and atheistic. And what has happened in every case? Do you know what's happened? What does the Adventist church do when that sort of thing happens? It's grown. Hmm? It's grown. Okay. And, but before that... It's gone underground. Well, what, what usually happens, what usually happens is this. Some of the people decide it's in order for us to represent the church to the, to the, to the, to the people around us, we must compromise somehow or other with the government. Hmm. But another portion of the church says, no, we can't compromise, and they go underground. And so you find that churches split. And... Uh, there, the people who go underground really, really suffer, usually. But is that what this is talking about? Is that what's going to happen? Uh, is the Adventist church worldwide, when there's an international Sunday law, what are we going to do? Are we going to split? Why does Ellen White tell us in some places that our worst enemies in the future are going to be former church members mm -hmm. who know us like the back of their hands and bring all sorts of accusations against They'll us. Have we have all the arguments. Have all the arguments. Well, Ellen G. White recognized that there were and will be times when we must do what is right, even though it may be in conflict with the commandments and laws of local or national governments. We remember that when she was growing up, there was still, still slavery was common. And she wrote these words in ter terms of relating to the government. When the laws of men conflict with the word and law of God, we are to obey the latter, whatever the consequences may be. The law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, and that was the law when she, uh, back in those days. The law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey, and we must abide the consequences of violating this law. The slave is not the property of any man, God is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim him as his own. Volume 1 of the Testimonies, 201 and 202. So there's a very specific example of how we should relate to government laws. We all, in principle, recognize that it would be good for Christians to work for the betterment of society. I think we all think that's a great idea. Can you think of an example when Christianity has actually bettered society? Think back through history, a time when the world, a major part of the world maybe, got better because of Christianity. Reformation. Yeah. Maybe the Reformation? What about way back in the days of the apostles? Yeah. I mean, as those first two or three hundred years when the church was pretty pure and the church grew like wildfire, the church got better. Well, but unfortunately it was not long before Satan got in there and messed things up. Can you think of a time when Christianity did not serve society well? Yes. World War II. <laughs> During World War II, we can think of the Nazi, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. It, it's mm -hmm. the largest Christian church, and they cooperated with the Nazis and the fascists. And Hitler was actually quite afraid because he knew he had a lot of Catholics under his control in, in, initially. And he watched and waited, and when they didn't give him any opposition. He knew he had the whole thing. 
Well, I know we're getting to the end, and we have to discuss the last quotation okay. in the handout. Let's go down, we'll drop down, we'll, we'll drop past uh, some of these. The, the, our Bible study guide says, in Paul's discussion of submission to one another, Ephesians 5, 21 to 6, 9, now he's jumped over to Paul now, not Peter, although Peter's what we're talking about. All four examples of how one submits involves relationships in which submission is one way and non-reciprocal. Wives to husbands, the church to Christ, children to parents, and servants or slaves to masters. Husbands are never commanded to submit to wives, nor Christ to the church, nor parents to children, nor masters to slaves. Authority and submission work only in one direction. This principle pervades scripture and it reaches into heaven and in some ways into eternity. And he quotes 1 Corinthians 11.3, which says, But I want you to understand that Christ is supreme over every man, the husband is supreme over his wife, and God is supreme over Christ. Does that mean that Christ is not equal with God? And 1 Corinthians 15.28, But when all things have been placed under Christ's rule, then he himself, the Son, will place himself under God, who placed all things under him, and God will rule completely over all. So, anybody want to Was oh, it true that Meyer should submit to me? Well, um, well before it, it, that passage in, in Ephesians uh, <coughs> 5, in tw verse 21, the tail end of the, Paul's thought is, and be subject to one another in the fear of the Lord. So, yeah, what about that part? So why, why isn't that only, quoted? Really, and only in mutual submission do you have the proper balance of things. There's... Mm -hmm. There certainly is an, an acknowledged leader, you know, for instance, you're the acknowledged leader here. We're not going to wrest control from you. So Maybe you but should. In, but in some ways, you, you sort of give in to us or you submit mm -hmm. to us. You know, we submit to each other and it moves along. Are you suggesting that the Bible study guide uh, might be incorrect, that, it's a, that they're one-way, non-reciprocal relationships of submission? Yes. And we have been saying all along that the principle of God's government is love. And if we, I don't care whether male, female, husband, wife, whatever our position, is if we're really acting out of love, how is that going to work? We, we don't even need to submit. We can just cooperate. You know, it, this is not a master-slave kind of an relationship. A kind and wonderful father. We thank you for these privileges we have to dig into your word and try to comprehend what is written there for us. Some of these verses might be challenging and we may t face times in the near future when we have to stand up or stand up against um, even our own government. If that's what's going to be necessary, we ask that you will, your Holy Spirit will guide us as we face those difficult times is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.